Good evening to one and all. Welcome to NTU, one of the top 15 most beautiful campuses in the world. And I'm repeating this for the last eight times. This is our ninth edition of our Monday Talks series. And uh, my name is Tolkien Lam. I'm the executive director of uh, local community engagement office at NTU. Um, the fact that you are here in the eve of, uh, of the long weekend, it signifies, it signifies your strong interest in this area called financial uh, technologies, fintechs. Huh? Fintech. So thank you very much for coming. Um, now, NTU um, has progressed quite a fair bit in the last few years. Um, now, if you look at the, um, the campus itself, it has undergone quite a fair bit of um, uh, redevelopment. As you can see, we have many new buildings. Uh, just next to, next to us, we have the learning hub called The Hive. We also have one newly opened one called The Ark. So these are the learning hubs where we actually um, house the so-called uh, uh, classrooms of tomorrow. We are using the flip classroom mode of teaching to teach our undergraduates. Um, we also have probably the first of its kind and the biggest of its kind of uh, sport, indoor sports hall on campus. We call it the WAVE. It is made of 90% um, engineered timber. If you have never been there before, do take a look. It's fantastic in, at our sports and recreation center. And um, as some of you might have already observed, we, also, we are also redeveloping our Yunnan garden. You know, you see the garden being cordoned off. We also have, we're going to um, blend the existing Chinese Heritage Center, Nanyang Lake, together with the, with the uh, Yunnan garden to, to, to make it the, probably the most beautiful garden you know, in all the campuses. So you're already probably in about a year time, so drop by again next time. And for those of you who love exercise, please do come to the campus. You know, you can do the morning or evening jog or walk on a blue campus. Very beautiful, you exercise, and at the same time, you can actually take a look at how NTU has been transformed over the last few years. Earlier on, talk talked about um, NTU has done very well in, 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 in both research and education, and I'm also trying to reach out to the community to, to uh, build the capacity of the community as well as to create impact on our community. And one of the things we do is to conduct this Monday Talk series. And as mentioned earlier on, this is our ninth edition. The purpose of it all is to um, um, help Singaporeans appreciate research and its benefit. So every time we invite um, a top professor from our university to talk about um, certain topic of interest, and at times we also invite um, industry players to come and um, share their experiences. So in so doing, we hope that, um, um, and, and this is a public lecture, we hope that um, you get to know more about what our professors are doing and, and what are the latest research trends as well you know, in, in, in the market. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our first speaker, um, um, Professor um, Lee Boon Keng. Professor Lee Boon Keng, um, is currently a social professor in finance, banking and finance at uh, Nang Business School, NTU. And um, uh, he was managing director and head of investment solution group at Bank Julius Baer in Singapore. And before that, he was a chief investment strategist in wealth management at UBS Singapore. And Dr. Lee did his PhD in economics at the New York University and his BA in mathematics in Northwestern University. And he's going to share with us from the educational point of view, the educational response to disruptive technology in finance. So let's put our hands together. Welcome, Professor Lee. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you, Dr. To. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is obviously very... Uh, quite photoshopped, so... Uh, maybe a little bit about myself, so that uh, perhaps we can s we can set that I, I got to stand in a strategic area, yeah. uh, so that we can kind of uh, get a sense of why I'm interested in this particular area today, or why I want to talk about this particular area today. Um, as uh, Dr. To said, I kind of came back into the university, NTU. I said came back, I returned 
to NTU about four years ago, uh, after having uh, left NTU in 1999 uh, to join the industry for about 15 years. And before that, of course, I was also teaching in NTU. So I've actually seen the campus, as you said, change from a fairly drappy campus to a very sprawling and very beautiful campus. Uh, that I can attest to. It's, very, it's actually quite nice now compared to, I would say, 20 plus years ago uh, when, when, when I, was, uh, I had started my career here. So uh, a lot of people ask me, every time I, I see them, uh, why would you quit the industry to join the uh, come back to education? Uh, the, the main reason is because uh, uh, teaching has always been my first love. So I always tell people I've been kind of with my s mistress for 15 years and now I'm kind of coming back to my first love. Uh, not a very good analogy, I know. I shouldn't be <laughs> saying that, but, you know, uh, the industry was some place that I felt that if I wanted to teach finance, uh, you got to go out there and figure out what people are actually doing, right? There's nothing wrong with teaching, uh, you know, the theoretical part of finance, uh, but I felt that, you know, I wanted to kind of get a more hands-on experience. I thought maybe I'll just leave the university for four or five years and then come back. Yeah, I didn't know I would be out there for 15 years, but it was a good trip. So um, four years ago, uh, the then Dean Ravi of Nanyang Business School at lunch with me and he basically asked me the following question. He said, um, you know, uh, what can we do, the university, uh, in order to, so that you will hire uh, our graduates? So I said, well, this is my kind of personal experience when I interview uh, you know, graduates or fresh graduates, right? And uh, the, my experience is the following. Um, you don't really have a lot to go with, right? Because nowadays, if you look at the resumes of uh, all the fresh graduates out there, you notice the following. You notice the following. Um, they always have very good grades, which I will talk about later. I don't like that, right? <laughs> Um, they, they always have many internships and with very branded name internships, all right? And they are very well prepared for the interviews, right? So it's almost like they've gone through some kind of training, you know? So, you know, it's very, very kind of stylized kind of way they come and answer your questions. If you throw them a little bit of curveball, that's where you see them sweat, all right? But, uh, you know... Uh, uh, they're all very well prepared, very good students. Uh, so he said, you know, what can they, uh, what can I do to stand? I said, no, actually not much because my personal experience is this. After the interview, right, right, the only thing I can really get is the following, right? This guy has the fire in his eyes, right? So then you look into that person, that fire in his eyes, okay, this guy's got a good attitude, right? Because the aptitude is guaranteed by the resume. Right, but you know, the attitude is kind of difficult to judge, but you kind of see that sparkle in the eyes, right? So you say, okay, I'm going to get this guy in. So this guy comes into my office, and, and what happens, right? The first thing I have to do is I have to send him out to, to train for training. I mean, that's just kind of ironical, right? This guy is like a first class honors, double degree, works in three, you know, uh, uh, internships, you know, speaks fairly well. But uh, I'm just using he not because of, of anything, just so it's easy for me to speak. Right? Uh, you know, but what's, what's the problem? What's the problem? He doesn't know how to use the tools, right? You sit in front, he sits in front of a, of a, of a Bloomberg machine and he's kind of freaked out by the colors on the, on the keyboard. If you guys have seen the Bloomberg machines, right, it's very colorful keyboards and this guy doesn't know anything. So what do I do? I have to send him out for training, right? And because I've already hired him, I can't say, okay, why don't you take six months off for a hardcore training, right, in the tools of the trade and then come back? I can't, right? So what do I have to do? I have to say, okay, you don't know this part, okay, why don't you take a class there and then you come back and you start to do it and then he starts to do something, right? And then he realizes, oops, there's something I don't know. And I say, okay, now I say, okay, why don't you go 
So, so not only was the process very long, it was very interruptive, right? So I say, okay, I told Ravi, I said basically this, look, um, actually all these tools, right, you can learn in the university, right? You can pick up the tools and learn in the university, all right? And then when you're out in the industry, you are what we call almost desk ready, right? Because you can't say that I'm a carpenter, but I don't know how to use a saw, you know? I know the theory behind using the saw, right? But I've never used a saw before. I mean, this just doesn't work, right? So you got to learn, you got to be trained to know the tools, right? And, and, and the university is the best place to do it because you have a lot of time to do it. In the industry, nobody gives you the time to learn the basic tools of the trade. You are expected to know the tools of the trade, right? So I say, he said, okay, that's a brilliant idea, all right? Uh, but I say, you got to spend money, right? Because uh, those tools don't drop down from the sky into your laps, right? And then uh, he said, don't worry, I have the money. I said, oh, really? <laughs> that's fantastic. But he, then he, he asked me, but if I pay, would you leave and join us? Because I need a champion for this. So I said, okay, if you leave, I would, if, if, if you have the money and build a lab, I will join you. But I, I actually didn't know that he actually got the money. <laughs> right? But he had the money. And it was a very, very expensive investment. Right? And uh, uh, so now, in, in NTU, Nanyang Business School, we have the largest Thomson Reuters icon training lab, I would say probably in the world, right? I haven't really gone out there to kind of calculate the numbers yet, but I would very much doubt that any one university would have 50 Thomson Reuters Icon data stream machine, right, in the lab, designed, all right, not for using, but for training, all right? And then in another lab, we have 25 Bloomberg machines, because Bloomberg is a little bit tricky, Right, it's a little bit more expensive to get more, but uh, we still say, okay, let's put in the money to get the Bloomberg machine. So now I've got all these things, right? So I, I came because right, I got a, you know, I'm a man of honor, all right? So I say, okay, since you've got the lab set up, all right, I come, all right? So here I am, we set up a center called the Center for Applied Financial Education. All right, and we launched a, a new track for the undergraduate. By the way, I'm only undergraduate, and my interest is always in undergraduates. All right, because I, I think I have time with them, and I can mold them, right? And, uh, and so we, we set up this lab, and we launched a new track called Platform-Based Learning. How was it received? Well, I must say the numbers are not spectacular, right, be very honest. And I'll tell you why maybe the numbers are not spectacular in a minute as well. But uh, I would say the following, the students that have graduated have got spectacular jobs, right? The, 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 the starting pay for them is about 40% higher than the average. That's, uh, that one I can say, all right? But the numbers are not a lot, right? And the reason why is because my, my intention of, of building this platform-based learning track uh, is to essentially build the finance DNA in the graduates, all right? And what do I mean by that? To have finance in your DNA, I tell you how you know you have finance in your DNA, just in case you guys have children who want to be finance people and you're, you're kind of, you know, you can't really draw the blood and test it, all right? It doesn't quite work this way. But I tell you how you know you have finance in your DNA. You know because if you don't check the market before you sleep, you don't sleep well, <laughs> right? And in the morning, the first thing you do is not to have that sip of water. It's to actually check the market, right? And, and, and then you are const your, your mind is constantly thinking about the market. I mean, that's the way it is, right? I think I'm losing some of the DNA, all right, or because I've been out for four years. But that was how it was. Right? And so I want to build that DNA in, so that was the intention. So when I came, right, I realized that, look, we have the machines now, we have the people 
you know, we've built the DNA into it. And then, of course, you know, over the last four years, something happened, right? And I'm going to just move on to my next. Something called disruption happened, right? When I came back, when I came to this campus, I said disruption was there, right? But it wasn't like, like what it is now, right? I mean, now everyone feels that their lives in one, one way or another is going to be changed, right? Because of the way that technology is going to affect the way that we live, right? Uh, someday, you know, we have chips in our arms that even tell us, you know, when we should be going to the restroom, which restroom we are, and so you, you're, you're basically trackable. I'm so sure that, you know, we may resist, right? But maybe the convenience will be too much for us to resist. But anyway, so disruption happened. So when disruption happened, I had to think about, right, how am I going to teach my students, or how am I going to produce a group of students that is somewhat ready for that disruption, right? A very uh, 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 much used phrase right now is future ready. So I've, I've done, I've kind of dealt with desk ready, right? Right? But I, I wasn't quite prepared for future ready. So when I came, I realized that, look, I need to to remold my, 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 my courses such that my students are future ready, right? So as I remolded my courses, I realized there are some obstacles of, of, of just plainly because of our education setup, which I will touch a little bit towards the end. So let me perhaps spend maybe five minutes because I'm not an expert in this area. Just like all of you, we are kind of living in it right now, all right? Maybe Rohan is a much better expert than me in, in terms of fintech, but I kind of feel that we are kind of living in the moment, right? We're kind of living in the moment. And, you know, the moment is not fixed, it's kind of changing. So here's my take of what all this disruption is going to do. The first thing is there is going to be some sense of democratization, uh, demo, this is a very difficult word to read, democratization. Right? It's kind of, to put it plainly, I think there's some sense of leveling the playing field. Right? There'll be some kind of leveling of playing field. Right? For example, I tell you this. If you put yourself, when I join an industry, right, and I have a Bloomberg machine in front of me, how fast can I learn the machine? Sometimes depends on my memory, because I have to remember the tickers. Right? When I type into it, I remember the stock ticker, I have to remember everything. And then all of a sudden, they got uh, uh, suggestions. Right? You don't even have to type, you don't even have to finish your thing. The guy will tell you, okay, here are the suggestions, find it, poop, you got it. Right? And then we got Google, right? So now that I teach my students, I say, forget about textbooks. Right? If, you, if you don't know something, just Google it. Because most students feel very uncomfortable about it, right? I say the textbook are probably outdated already by the time you bought it, all right? So, you know, maybe you want to just Google it. And if you can't find the answer, don't understand it when you Google it, maybe you can talk to me. Maybe I know, maybe I don't, but, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe from my experience, I can direct you to where I think you should be looking at. That's probably as much as I can tell you because there are certain things I don't claim to know everything. I certainly won't, don't. don't. So democratization, the leveling of playing field, I think that's what disruption is going to do to us, right? You can probably now, without prior knowledge, know something like that, right? There is no struggle anymore, right? In the past, you've got to struggle to find the information. There is what we call information asymmetry. You know more than I do, and therefore I know more than, you know, I can do so I know more than you do, that, therefore I can do. There's no such thing anymore. Right? I think that's, 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 gonna, that's what disruption is ultimately going to do for us. Right? Make you and I, in the, in the world of information, the world of how we do, right, roughly the same. The second thing that I think is going to happen is this thing called, another difficult word to read, I'll try, 
commoditization, right? With this level playing field, my suspicion is that everything now is going to be just a commodity, right? That there is no, there is no special element to something anymore. Not today, lah. But the direction, I think we're going in that direction. Right? Think about how you used to call your broker to execute a trade. Right? I mean, now, you would be... It would be quite costly for you to do that now. Right? Because you can simply log on to your computer, all right? fire up a interface and actually do your execution right there at a fraction of the cost. And probably nobody uses the stockbroker except to maybe chit chat with him about the weather or think about, you know, where to eat, you know, or maybe just a little bit about what he thinks about the market. You know why you don't even really want to know what he thinks about the market? Because of what I just told you earlier, right? We have democratization of information, right? Maybe he can't even really recommend you a nice place to eat anymore because you also know, right? So it becomes a kind of exchange of ideas rather than finding out more, right? So commoditization is going to happen uh, mainly because things are going to be so leveled, right? We don't have to struggle uh, in terms of trying to figure out you know, what are the costs involved in doing certain things because they will be quite cheap for us to do it and you therefore will do it. So based on these two beliefs that I have, huh, this is just my own belief, I could be totally off the track, huh, just FYI. Right? Based on these two beliefs I have, I think that the future of finance right, involves something what I call micro-solutions. Right? Information really, you know, can't cut it anymore. Right? In the past, you know, because you have more information than me, therefore you do better than me, I think that just doesn't cut it anymore, right? Because of what, we, what I just said. Solutions matter. Right? In the future, you call your broker, not because you want to know about the market, you want him to offer you a solution that is tailor-made for your needs, right? That's probably what you want. But you're not this guy that is a multi-billionaire, you know, maybe you are, right? But in case you're not, you're not going to be this guy that has so much money in the bank that the bank is going to say, look, I'm going to take this amount of resources and create a solution just for you. That's not going to happen, right? Right? But you still want a solution. Right? The solution could involve the following. Let's say we just take, for example, all right, very simple question I want to ask. All right? Uh, by the way, uh, all these stocks that I have, uh, can you tell me um, how did it perform in the last three months? And based on certain belief I have, uh, how does it perform in the next three months, based on certain belief I have? That's, that's a question, that's a legit question, right? Right? So now, what the bank has, of course, it has a kind of cookie-cutter kind of solution for you, right? Right, they send you a monthly statement, you look at the monthly statement, all right? Sometimes you can get into the bank, you know, maybe you can log on and see exactly your performance and, and whatnot, right? But, you know, what, what if you have something that you say, okay, I have certain belief. How can you help me solve this problem, right? I think that, you know, 30% of my stock is going to go this way. Another 30% is going to go the other way. You know, can you tell me, you know, what is it going to be like tomorrow or three months from now if my belief happens? You want that solution. And you're not going to get it because you're not the bank is not going to put the money on, on, that, on that simple solution for you. Who's going to put that solution for you? A person who is trained in providing micro-solutions. A person who knows the finance domain, has the, fin the finance domain knowledge, but at the same time is going to be able to slap together right, 
a application that is tailor-made for you. And that will happen in the next 30 minutes, not in the next 30 days. That has to be the case because of democratization, because of commoditization. That is the only value add the guy has. If he's not able to provide you with that solution in the next 30 minutes, he has no value because you also know where is the best Cha Kui Tiao in Singapore. Right? You also know where is you know, the, the, you know, the fastest way to get from point A to point B. So there's nothing that, that the bank can offer you in those services anymore. So let me spend five minutes on coming back to disruption. The one area that I think has to be disrupted almost so urgently so urgently is education. Education is not facing the disruption that it ought to be facing. Right? I give you an example. So I set up this thing, right? So I said, okay, I gotta train my students, they gotta do all these things, right? They gotta learn how to code, right? They gotta learn, they, they have this finance domain knowledge, they gotta learn how to code. Then you go out there and you realize that, oh damn. I can't find them coders to teach them. I can't because the school doesn't, the school doesn't work this way, right? If you want to learn coding, you go up to computer science and you learn coding, right? Right, and you got to learn coding from A to Z, right? And then maybe get a computer science degree, right? But that's just one of the problems. So even if I can solve that problem for you, which I have, huh? so I hire a coder, he comes in teach my student coding, right? Then I have another problem. The output from that course, the output from that course, how am I going to grade it? I'm not an expert in financial application, right? I am a finance expert. Well, I hope I'm a finance expert. And I know there's a computer science expert somewhere there Right, who may have played a part in developing this thing, but he has no domain knowledge either. So how am I going to grade this thing? So I thought of a brilliant idea. I said, okay, why don't we get the industry people to come and grade this thing? Right, so I pick up my phones, I call people, and they say, okay, sounds like an interesting thing. Why don't I spend my Saturday morning and come and grade this? So my students pitch to them, right? Right? So the students come here, they've prepared all their financial applications and all these things, they start to pitch to these people and then these people grade them based on you know, all these things. Then I realized, oh gosh, I got another problem. Now that I've solved the problem of how I'm going to grade these people, right? I realized that I must actually give them a physical grade, like an A or a B, right? Or a B plus. Then I realized something. They are all A's. Right? They are all A's. Why are they all A's? Because they are already almost commercializable products. Otherwise, they can't even stand in front of the pitch. At worst, A, at best, A+. Plus. So now here I have a problem, right? I got all these things and I go to the school and I say, school, A+, plus and A, they say, what? Where is your bell curve? Where is your all these things? Where, what, you mean all brilliant? So you can see, you know, the, 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 the way that the university has to say, look, how do I de-emphasize grades? How do I emphasize the process and ultimately the product or the outcome? How do I even say, okay, if I want to talk about cross-disciplinary learning, right? Can two professors come together and teach a course across discipline? Yeah, that's, that's, that's easy. That's, that can be done. That's not a problem, right? But you still have to solve that great problem, right? How do you de-emphasize great? Then I realize there's a problem too. Okay, let's say the university said I de-emphasize great. 
right? I am this breakthrough university. You come here, all right? Everything you do is output, not output, the process, the output, and people love it. And you say, okay, this is a great student, da da da. We, we, we love him and all this. Then you present this to the industry, right? Right? And the industry got a problem. We have so many students going out to the industry at one shot, and guess how they do the first cut of elimination? You know. Because I was now, now, I know now, I mean, back then I already knew. Every resume that landed on my desk, a double degree, first class honors, three you know, branded things, they, they're all the same people. So sometimes I wonder what happened to the guy who's not a first class honors with branded, uh, what happened to that guy? How come his thing never landed on my desk? Because, look, for every one position, there are 500 applications. What do you want the HR person to do? Right? The HR person has no alternative, no choice but to take all these things and, and try to filter it and then finally shortlist to the ones that, you know, just based on, without even interview, based on it and say, okay, look at this person. Right? So hiring needs to be disrupted too. You know, when I first came back, I'm going to end just here. When I first came back to Singapore, and um, I was asked to send out my resume. So I sent out my resume <coughs> 20 plus years ago. And I was so shocked that when uh, the, 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 uh, the, the company called me and said, uh, can we know uh, uh, your age? C can we know, of course, my name is Lee Boon King, right? Sometimes girls also have that kind of name. <laughs> so. Uh, can you please state your, your sex and, and your address, right? Uh, your race, all right? And can we have your, uh, what do you call that, transcript, right? Uh, so I, I said, okay, la, since I'm desperate for a job, you know, here's all my information for you. But you see where the problem is, right? Right? So I, I think hiring needs to be disrupted, but that, that is a HR issue. But education right, needs to be disrupted too. And, and I, I hope that at some point in time, we will really come to a point where the grades get so unimportant that the industry will never ask for it again. Right? And really look at that person and say, OK, come, let's talk. So that's, that's all I have. Thank you. I hope I kept to my time. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Excuse me, you need a clicker? I think I do. Can we, can we on the mic? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Prof Lee, for your insightful uh, sharing. Um, next up is um, um, another very um, heavyweight speaker. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you do pay to pay pair? Raise of hand. A lot of us, right? Okay. So um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Um, um, Rohan uh, Mahadevan. Um, as PayPal Senior Vice President of Asia Pacific, and he's also the CEO of um, PayPal Private Limited, um, Dr. Rohan Mahadevan provides strategic direction for one of the company's fastest growing regions, covering many of the largest commerce markets in the world. Based in Singapore, he is responsible for increasing the company's presence and local payment capabilities. Dr. Rohan was a postdoc scientist at Cambridge University, England. He also holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics from uh, Caltech, um, USA, and a PhD from Harvard University in the fields of astrophysics. And um, he's going to share with us the future of fintech and what it means to you and of course to all of us. So uh, let's put our hands together to welcome Dr. Rohan, please. Oh, maybe it should be on. Yeah, I think it's on. Okay, can. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you so much for that fantastic speech, actually, on disruption and democratization. It's actually, um, it's, it's, 
it's very similar to what I'm going to be also talking about, which is disruption is happening now. Uh, democratization is happening now on financial services and, and institutions as well. And that's actually forming why, where we create opportunities. And actually, what's very interesting, which I'll talk about, is the micro solutions that you're talking about is what <clears throat> new payment providers have to start thinking about. Not micro solutions necessarily, but solutions. Because different parts of the money exchange value chain is being commoditized. Okay. Um, <clears throat> very interestingly, you know, yes, I do have a degree you know, from all these universities. Um, and everybody and their grandfather was the CEO of some company in 2003 in the Silicon Valley. And so I actually didn't get a job for about... All right, so I didn't get a job. Yeah. Oh, really? Here you go. Maybe it's on. So I can't, can't go to that side of the, of the room. I can. Okay, good. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so actually, I was without a job for about 18 months, despite uh, you know, all those degrees. So I completely agree with what you're saying. And it was, I was good enough to have uh, my hiring manager um, be able to at least identify certain qualities like curiosity. Um, at that time, I had a lot of drive, uh, and probably even more than I have right now. Um, and so I think those are the qualities that they looked for, for me um, in, in me before they hired me into the, into the company. So what I'd like to do today is spend, um, spend a few minutes just talk uh, three things I'd like to share with you today. One is a brief history of money and how money has moved um, and to create trade, and what I believe some of the key elements of money are. The second is to actually look at all the disruption that's been happening right now as we, as we are here. There's a lot of disruption that's happening. And what that disruption has done to actually create opportunities for small businesses, individuals around the world. And then share a little bit, I, don't, I, I can't in any way be you know, a, a clairvoyant. If I was, I may not be here right now. But um, it's one, I would like to share a little bit about the kinds of technologies that I believe are going to be used in the future that will change and even disrupt more what we're doing today in terms of money. So, we started off at the barter system. If you, if you uh, went back you know, 9,000 years ago, um, we basically, humans, um, basically started trading in, uh, in, in terms of grain, in terms of cattle, in terms of milk, etc. And of course, the challenge with that is if you wanted to trade with somebody on the other side of uh, you know, the city, you had to take your cow over there, you had to take your grain over there, and you'd have to hope that that person at the other end of the city wanted that cow, wanted the grain, or wanted the milk. Right, then, in at about you know, a, a little bit you know, sooner than that, about 600 BC, um, with the first coins were minted um, in, in which is now present-day Turkey. Uh, King Aliates, I believe, um, of Lydia was the one who actually did that. And that was great, because now everybody had the access to coins and had access to some denomination that had a backing. And they could trade that and exchange it for goods of their choice. But the challenge, of course, with coins was that they were, you needed raw materials, like silver, gold, bronze, et cetera, to make those coins. And so you know, the first paper money really came about in 1661. And what was great about paper was that it was paper, right? as long as you had something to back it. And then you could actually create a lot of it. And it f the trade really flourished, because now you created a lot of it, you backed it with something, and you could actually, the velocity of trade started increasing significantly. But that was all paper, physical, in-person, things like that. Then we started moving to digital. Okay. And in digital, the first company that actually started doing telegrams or telegraphs was Western Union where they actually had a, a network around the world where now I could go to a certain store, I could tell somebody something, they would send the money through a wire, right, that's where you have wire transfers, and then somebody could pick it up on the other end. It was fantastic, right? And then you moved into the first charge it card. By a person by the name of John Biggins started this, where you could take a card 
and you could charge it at a point, point of sale or something else, and you could start trading goods. And of course, today, we have things in the cloud, okay, where there's no physical card, there's no physical presence, and there are transactions that are happening in, whether you want to call it cyberspace, the internet, the cloud, what have you, but it's happening in the human-created ether. Okay. And this has happened very rapidly. Now, the, fund the, three, the four fundamental things, apart from, of course, value, which the regulators participate in and make sure that the value of currency is preserved, is speed, security, protection, and capital. As time has moved on, speed has started becoming commoditized. Back in 1999, when PayPal first came um, onto the forefront in 1997, it was very difficult to send money. eBay, where people would transact with each other, somebody would buy you know, a pencil from some, from a person in Boston would buy a pencil from somebody in, in San Francisco. They would make the purchase on eBay, and then they would open an envelope, put in 10 bucks, close the envelope, mail it to Boston. That's what would happen. And, and that was amazing that people trusted each other. Right, on that marketplace, and it was amazing. eBay was an amazing phenomenon. And then PayPal came in and said, you can do this instantly. Right? So speed was, was a differentiator for a company called PayPal, which is where I work right now. But to, as all these other payment methods have come in, you see the, you know, the union pays, the MasterCard, the PayPal, the Alipay, et cetera, speed has become more and more commoditized. Right? The same thing has happened with security, you could argue blockchain, you know, the new kinds of cybersecurity, all of these things have started to commoditize security as well. Encryption, things like that. Where protection, this comes back to the, the, the microservices or the microservices, is protection. You can send money today with a bank account to another person with another bank account. But what happens if you don't get the goods? What happens if you buy a TV, you send it to somebody, you send, you know, 5,000 sing to someone, but you don't get the product. The bank said, you authorized that transaction. You wanted it to be sent to that person. You should have made sure that that person was a good person and, and was going to give it to you. And so this is where services like PayPal do come in, in addition to speed and security, where we will now, you can come to us, and we can actually we'll give you back that 5,000 sing because we know who the merchant is, we know who the buyer is, we know what the, we want to keep the system safe. And then the last, and most importantly for small businesses, is capital, right? You need credit on the consumer side, and you need capital on the merchant side in order to make sure that, because you can, you can buy things so that you can sell them, right? And so these are the kinds of, as you get from, you go from commodity into the services that become really important, it's not just the movement of money, but the value that you add on top of it. Right? So very similar to the previous discussion we were having. So what does this mean? What has happened is we did a survey. So now coming to the second part is, what does this mean for all of us? So we actually did it. We commissioned an independent survey um, last year. On, we, we looked at merchants around Southeast Asia, consumers around Southeast Asia, and asked them, like, what do they think? I mean, you know, what do they think about all this disruption and what's going on and, and, and how should we kind of understand what the customer needs are so we can make the change ourselves. And what we found is it went from inclusion, financial inclusion, which is do you have access to a bank, to actually do you know what financial health is. And financial health has three things associated with it. One is making sure that you can take care of your financial obligations okay, at a cost-effective way. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a second. The second is, if I'm just selling into one country and something happens to that country or the economy or something happens, then I, I can't sell my goods anymore. Or I can't sell my services anymore if I'm an artist. So how do I make sure I can withstand financial shock? So how do I create a portfolio of businesses around the world so that I have customers everywhere? And then the last is, which is really disruptive, especially now, is how do I, how can I take my hobbies that I have 
and make them into economies. Okay. How do I actually take the things I love and actually create a business out of it? And I'll share with you a, uh, a video, a short video, where we actually, um, where we act, one of our videos that we actually um, uh, have a customer of ours who shares what he, where he has, what he has done and where he has come from. But just let's start with the financial obligations. How many of you still actually um, write a check and, and to fulfill your credit card bill, say? Okay, some of you do that, right? Or go to your bank account and do a bank transfer to it, right? Yeah, a lot of, and then you may, so what happens a lot in that process is you get the bill, you have to remember right, when its due date is, and then, I mean, you, sometimes you forget, um, and some, some is in cash, some of it is in the bank transfer, some of it somewhere else. And what ends up happening is you pretty much miss one or two of those payments, or three or four of those payments in a, in a year. Right? And when you do that, of course, you get charged extra money, you get a charge of financial fee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know I've, I, I do some of that as well right now, because I have to, I have to, I mean, I've relocated from the US and I still have to pay some bills back in the US, and that's a big pain because they don't accept PayPal for me. So 54% of people actually who still use cash or some form say that it's too costly for them, okay, as opposed to 21% of people who actually use a digital way of doing things, right? If you have all your stuff in one place, you can just click, click, click. It's just more organized, more managed, and I think that's, it's, it, it feels like a no-brainer, but people who have access to both still choose to do the cash option because it's something they're familiar with, right? And I think they need to disrupt themselves as opposed to trying to you know, keep to what's been going on in the past. The second thing is we, we, we surveyed a lot of the merchants. So merchants, small businesses, as well as individuals. So one of the big, big industries in Southeast Asia are freelancers, okay? whether it's in Singapore, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, where individuals will f have a job, whether it's designing, whether it's translating, whatever, and will start selling these services to the world. And you've see, you know, I've talked to these merchants and these, and these entrepreneurs, and it's amazing stories where, I'll sh again, I'll share one with you, where an individual, this woman I met in the Philippines, started a, a design business for shirts 10 years ago when she was 14. And now at 25, she runs a 40-person organization selling shirts globally. Fantastic, right, because of the employment. And so it really basically helps increase your opportunity that, you're gonna, that you see it right now. So it unlocks new businesses, accesses global markets. And the last thing is the most important thing. Today, I'm gonna come across here. Today, um, you just don't sell on a website, right? What you need to do is you need to start selling where people are spending their time. And today, people are spending their time on Facebook. They're spending their time on Instagram. They're spending their time on WeChat, on WhatsApp. On all these different social media sites is really where people are spending time. They don't have time necessarily to come to your website and actually seek you out. They can, and they still do. They still go to marketplaces like Wish, or Alibaba, or Lazada, or eBay, et cetera. But where they're starting to spend more and more of their time is on social media. And that's where you need to be in technology for any service provider, or where we are, in order to make sure that you can close the sale when the conversation is happening. Classic discussion, you go to the market, you go to Chinatown over here, you walk by a store, you talk to the store owner, and you say something, and you say, okay, I'll come back. What does that mean? I'm not coming back, right? <laughs> I'm done, That's your price is too high, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. The same thing happens on social media. If you're talking to someone, you don't want that person to go away. You want, you want to say, here's a link, click on it in one click, you can pay me the five bucks down payment, and, I, and I'll send you the goods. And that's the kind of technology that you're, you needed to start building in order to make of the, avail of those services. So what this is really doing is it's going from hobbies, whether you're doing stamps, whether you're doing photography, or you know, whether you're doing records, um, you can start selling your hobbies and making economies out of it. 
So the next video is, I think it's a one minute, two minute video, um, is about a merchant in India. And he actually set up a store, you'll see it, in, in the biggest slum in Bombay. Okay, he actually lived in the biggest slum in Bombay. And he tells you about his journey. And take this and see, and this is exactly what happens. These are these freelancers or small business which happen across Southeast Asia and the world, which actually is, and I'll, and I'll share why companies like ours can actually bring this to life. Um, but I'd like you to take a look at this first. company actually get up every morning and go to work. Um, the reason why that is possible is because of risk management. For an individual like you and me, if you wanted to accept credit card transactions from anywhere in the world, anywhere, instant in within three minutes, I would challenge you to go to any bank that you know and try to ex start accepting those payments in three minutes. Because typically what happens is they need to know that you're not a cheat and you're not a fraud and that you have a sustainable long-term business. But these people just want to try, want to try something, right? And I think that's where, and I'll share a little bit about how PayPal comes in and actually our business is about risk management. Okay? But what this is, what you've just seen is, is not, you know, it's, it's a, really it's a hundred trillion dollar opportunity globally, which is huge, $100 trillion, right, of opportunity of individuals like this who can actually employ other individuals and start actually doing, conducting commerce globally, which is, which is really, really inspiring to me and also a great goal to have to try to address and connect more of these people globally. A little bit, two slides on PayPal specifically. $100 trillion, we are big, we're the biggest in the world, but we're still small compared to the opportunity at hand. So we processed last year $451 billion globally across 200 different countries. We have about 209 million customers, uh, consumers globally. So when you as an individual merchant in the Philippines or in Thailand or in Singapore and Vietnam, sign on with PayPal, you have access, the trust that the individual is talking about, 
you have access to 209 million customers globally who use, who use our services, which is, which is phenomenal and which is big. Um, and mobile is a big deal on this, and we have 18 million merchants um, across, across the world. And the real reason, as I mentioned, why we can actually do this is we invest more than a billion and a half dollars every single year in our risk management services. So that individuals, a lot of, we see a lot of individuals who come on and who have no intention of selling the goods, none. And basically, we'll, the, the consumers will pay the merchant, but then we identify that this is happening and we actually give all the money back to the consumer. Okay. And then we catch the merchants, we work with regulators, we work with law enforcement around the world, et cetera, to keep these things safe. But if you put all of that together, and then you also, of course, sometimes have bad buyers, right, who want to cheat the merchants, right, who want to steal credit cards, make the transaction, and then it's not their money, actually. And we identify these bad buyers, and we keep the merchants safe as well. If you put all of this together, it's a billion and a half dollars every year that we actually invest in our business to keep the system safe. And that's why the, you know, we want to keep doing that so we can go from the 451 billion you know, and go up to, you know, try to address more and more of that $100 trillion, which is global. A little bit about the technologies of the future, and, um, and then, you know, we can wrap up. And this is really not about how I see the future in any way whatsoever, um, because I can't see the future. Um, but it's more about the kinds of technologies that I'm seeing now that we believe are quite real. And as they mature, um, we think that it will increase the velocity of trade and increase the security of the systems that we have and be able to provide better services to customers who are using this, this system. So the first is AI. Very real, as you all know. And you start using AI, you start using it to detect fraud, you start using it to, to provide better credit scoring, you start using it to do all sorts of things that will help make money move faster. Okay. So AI is very real. That's things that we're looking at. Um, you know, we have people in our company who are using that in order to look at fraud, um, look at credit ratings, and different kinds of things associated with that. The second is, of course, blockchain. This is very different from cryptocurrency. This is blockchain. And blockchain just, just provides that added level of security and determination and, and make it, it makes things more deterministic and this is something that I, I believe will actually start commoditizing we, we start our commoditizing commoditizing this whole concept of security and ownership of authentication right? you don't need to authenticate things anymore if you are if you if you've built a blockchain around it and last um, but definitely not least is augmented and virtual reality if any of you have kind of gone into the, any of these augmented and virtual reality you know, environments, these things are just really going to accelerate the pace of commerce. Because when you're in a room and you can see and feel and know the size of things around you, if you're doing fashion or you're buying boxes or you're buying furniture or you're actually seeing your design or you're interacting with your seller in that kind of an augmented virtual reality environment, it's going to increase the velocity of trade significantly and create more and more time in that network. And that's going to be extremely real and something that we all need to watch out, watch out for. The last slide I'll just want to leave you with, you know, coming back to education that we started with, actually. Um, we're also a lot, you know, we've, we worked with the, we work with, um, you know, NTU, NUS, and SMU. As well as, um, the single, as well as the EDB. And we actually launched something called the PayPal Innovation Lab about two years ago. And it, what, was, what was so exciting to me about it was that it combined you know, the three things that you know, Singapore is looking at from, from a government perspective. Right? One is, of course, productivity. Right? The second is intellectual property. Right? And the third is making sure that you have you know, innovation from a startup perspective and being the center hub for startups. And so those were the three things that we also were interested in with, these, with the universities. And we've been trying, we've been taking in students, um, postdoc, postgrad students and undergrads into, um, into, our pro, into a startup incubation and well as doing research, building IP, 
writing patents about it, and giving some of the real time, you know, real life learnings um, of, of how it, what it means to actually be in this environment. It helps us tremendously because the innovation is really coming from the next generation, right? The innovation, the way they interact with things, the way they interact with um, you know, technology is just so different from the way I interact with technology, as an example. So bringing that into our, into our so we, this is a, the background is a little bit of a reflection of our startup um, incubation area in, um, in our offices at um, SunTech, uh, SunTech. And so it, it's really um, fantastic for us to be here to be working with these you know, very prestigious universities and the government in trying to drive a lot of that innovation and becoming part of the community um, and trying to push forward the key areas of innovation, IP, and productivity. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rohan, for your sharing. And uh, may I invite um, both uh, speakers to take a position in front over here for our panel discussion. I also like to invite um, Professor um, Ding Seng Kiong, the Dean of um, College of Professional and Continuing Education, NTU, to be um, seated as well. And of course, the moderator for today's um, panel discussion and Q&A, um, uh, Dr. Douglas Streeter Roth. He's also the um, Program Academic Director of Nanyang um, uh, Professional MBA Program as well as Senior Lecturer in our um, um, Banking and Finance MBAs. So I'll pass the floor to uh, uh, Doug and um, he will take over from here to facilitate the uh, discussion as well as Q&A. Thank you. Press it. Well, uh, th thank you very much for coming down, and thank you, uh, Bung Kang and Ron, uh, Ro Ron, to uh, give uh, such an um, educational and insightful set of talks. And I, I, before we started this, uh, I was uh, talking with the team organizing, and, and I was thinking there must be a lot of you here who are thinking, what can I do to make sure my child doesn't get disrupted. Am I right? And, and so what we thought we'd do is just open up the floor. Any questions? Uh, there are people with microphones. Okay, we've got the first one over here. My name is Tan King Sui. I'm just an investor. I'm from the heartland. I was very impressed by Dr. Lee Fong King. Talk about Thomson, Reuters, machines, Bloomberg machines. I just looked into it on the internet. That's all there is. And then the thing is that can you disrupt all this Thomson, Reuters, Lee Boon King, and so on? So on? I think you can. Warren Buffett, it's nothing. Say hello to you. It's obvious of people. There's uh, somebody in India here, somebody here. Say he's 83 years old, 84 years old. Oh, when I die, you take over. Then his friend is telling Munger and so on. He's got a wife. Uh, he's got a lot of girlfriends. So he's got a lot of money in SP. So he's, he's famous man on SP. Against the hedge funds and so on. Oh, no, bring him here. All his prodigy, all his friends here. All the office. Rob you. Can it happen? Can you be disrupted? Silly Boon King. I'm, I'm not so sure what it means by myself being disrupted. <laughs> uh, I, I guess in a sense is, is, is it possible that there will come a point in time where a person like myself uh, being an educator, uh, no longer, you know, is educating anymore. Uh, that will be a disruption to me. I, I think that's a disruption to me, right? Um, to be honest, I'm already doing a lot of that, right? As I told you, my class 
uh, my courses require my students to produce uh, financial applications that are commercializable that are now going that, that they have to pitch to the industry uh, in fact one of my students little project was bought by a hedge fund last year uh, good money for her I guess because it was a you know three four months uh, project and she managed to sell it so I'm very happy for her right there's another one that is being picked up by a company for further development so they're commercializable stuff um, what do I do in a class um, to be honest I, I hope the Dean is not here <laughs> nothing <laughs> right so I am being disrupted right maybe one day the Dean will realize I'm doing nothing and say okay Maybe we don't need you anymore, <laughs> right? But I tell you what I do. All right, I don't teach them coding. I found someone to teach them coding. Um, I really taught them all that I can teach them in my first encounter with them. So when they start developing that thing, it was a second encounter with them. I, really, I told them very honestly, look, there's nothing more I can teach you, right? If I were to tell you I can teach you more, it'd be rubbish because <laughs> I've already taught you everything that I know so what do I do first I give them the platform right this is a course that you sign on all right and I'm trying to bend the rules a little bit right like I say I submitted a list of A's and A pluses and try to convince a school to accept that as the grades you guys have no idea how challenging that is Right? I mean, for those of you who think that, why not? Well, no, yeah, why not? The school said no. Right? So it, it, it took a little bit. Of, in other words, what I'm trying to tell from A and A pluses is that actually the grades are not important. For all you know, it could be all Fs or all Cs, right? Because it, it's homogenous. Right? Everyone got the same grade. <laughs> so why well, there's no differentiation? So why does grade matter in that thing, right? Um, so I give them the platform, I give them the time to discuss with me what I think about things. I don't have all the answer, but I think I have certain domain knowledge in finance, right? That maybe I can say, okay, I think if I, you know, I could imagine like this little thing that we're doing involves natural language processing, right? Where it's like the Siri of finance, right? You can pick up the phone and you say, Siri, when was the last time Apple traded, you know, at $200? Has it been $200 yet? Let's say, right? Oh, Siri, how many times did Apple trade um, or increase by more than 1% in the last 20 years? Right? And, and, the, and the machine will give you the answer. That's natural language, right? That means I'm leveling the playing field for all of you. Right? You no longer need a Bloomberg. You no longer need a Thomson Reuters. You just flip up your phone and you talk to your phone. Right? And then, of course, if you think about the further development like what PayPal does, you can execute. <laughs> Once you talk, talk to the phone, you like the thing and say, okay, can you buy 200 shares for me? Done. That's it. Right? So I provide that that guidance, uh, I mean, yeah, I am being disrupted, uh, FYI, right? And, and to be honest, quite happily so, right? Because, you know, what can I do, right? I mean, I, you know, there's come a point in time where you feel that, look, the, the only way you can open up the young folks' minds is to not pretend that you actually know more than they do. Because I actually don't, honestly. My students are all brilliant, uh, FYI for information. Brilliant students. I'll add on to that. I actually also teach in the program and it's true that students are um, a, really an exceptional group. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to teach them. What I teach actually is a class on uh, what are called an investment theses. So if anybody here is an investing, you know, there's a reason why you go and uh, buy a stock. You know, there's a thought process that goes into it. And so I, I teach them how that thought process works and how to apply it to find great companies, come up with great theses. A lot of that then revolves around 
getting insight and asking questions about the company. What, what does this information mean? How do I know it's true? Is this something that's important that's going to be important in the future? So, so it's that process of, of critical thinking. Really, you know, the one group of people that will never be outsourced or disrupted are the people that provide insight. That's it. And to the extent that we can teach them how to um, deliver that insight. And a lot of it's through asking questions and trying to understand what things mean, that critical thinking skill. That part I think that we can deliver the most value on. So okay, there's another question. We got one. Any questions? Any questions? We got a question over here. over here. Excellent. Yeah, this this uh, this question is maybe more for um, Dr. Lee. Um, so you compare what we are currently currently trying to do in NTU um, versus what the other schools are doing globally. Yeah. Um, how how are we compared to them? Are we like catching up or are we actually doing okay? Right. And so this is part one of the question. And part two is that you know for for example, Dr. Rohan has already pointed out some of the future trends. Right, on AI, blockchain, and other good stuff. How are we training our students to be ready for that next generation tech so that we are not playing catching up? Because I think this is quite important because the whole Singapore economy, right? we are sort of re-engineering ourselves to be ready for the next wave, to be the digital nation. H how do we get ourselves ready? For it? Because I sort of you know, get worried when I read the reports that other countries or universities are doing sort of pretty well. I'm not sure how well you know, they are they doing in this, this part of the technology. So thanks, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, honestly, I don't answer uh, to how well we are doing on those fronts with respect to other people. I'm sure everyone is putting resources um, into you know, all these things. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you that we're highly ranked and stuff like that, but, you know, um, I can tell you what worries me. <laughs> uh, what worries me has always been, uh, as far as Singapore education is concerned, and I, I'm a big champion of this, uh, that we tend to box our kids at very young age. Right, so I was in a round table a couple of years ago uh, and they were asking, you know, how come there are so few entrepreneurs in Singapore? How can we encourage entrepreneurship, right? Uh, taking risks, all these things, right? So there was a lot of discussions and stuff like that. You know, of course, one of them is definitely, you know, dare to fail and, you know, do not punish failure. You know, because failure, you learn from it, right? I mean, that's a great idea. But concretely, how do you do it, right? You know, it's all nice to have motherhood statements, right? I always think it's very nice. All these motherhood statements, you know, encourage failure. Very nice. But how do you concretely get it done, right? So I, I say, okay, you know, after all this discussion, how about we just scrap PSLE? <laughs> so that, that, so the, the, you know, the guy said, why, why do you scrap PSLE? I say, look, statistically... Statistically, girls do better than boys in PSLE. There's a given statistics. What does it mean? It means that girls are more mature when they're 12 years old than the guys, the boys. And that's why the boys don't do as well. But that's not the problem. Huh? The problem is when you are 12 years old, immature, you are already branded. Can you imagine this guy, 12 years old, right, still playing computer games, right, trying to know, do, do new things and explore, and his minds are all exploding in so many places, not physically, right? A and then, right, he receives his grades, right, and his, his whole life is now, right, classified by three numbers, right? Whether you're 254 or 237 or 100 or whatever, right, that's your life. Now, this is, this is Singapore's problem, right? We don't have that many smart people. Oh, no, I should say. We don't have that many people. <laughs> right? We, we don't have a lot of people. 
around us. We can't let them slip through the cracks. Yeah, we, we can't let them slip through the cracks, I always say, right? So you got this guy, this boy, you know, not doing very well, right? And then guess what he does? He ended up in some, you know, school of not his choice. And his whole life is branded, you know? And you know what it is or not? The punishment is so severe. It's so severe, you know? You're there, that's it. That's your life. 12 years old, branded, chopped, then you're gone. And then you say, oh, you know, all this motherhood statement, let's support failure, you know. That's a Your motherhood statement and what you're doing, they don't match. Right? PSLE is the most devastating exam for a young boy to go, or a young, young person to go through. Right? And, and it, it destroys all the creativity that you can, because you know what? From primary three to primary six, all you do is just make sure that you get 270. <laughs> That's your whole life. Your whole purpose is already determined by that. So the question is, what do you replace PSLE with? Nothing. La. <laughs> Why do you need to replace PSLE with something? Nothing. Right, and then you just, and, and this is. I had a conversation with with, uh, with 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 someone several years ago. He said, you know, you you notice that the pressure for the Western. I'm not saying that Western education system is better. I'd never said that. Huh? Like you, you realize that the the pressure comes at a later stage. It's backloaded. Right, and I can tell you this. I went to the university uh, in the U.S. And this is my observation, okay? The Asians are never your number one in the class. They're never number one. They're the number two. They're good, no? They shift the curve. But there's a number one guy, and he's always not Asian. He's either an American, right? Most of the time, a Jewish American. <laughs> Most of the time. Right? The Asians are at the top echelon, but never at the top. There's a reason why, you know. I tell you, there's a reason why, because we can never break through that barrier. If we are branded from young at a certain type of person, how do you expect that guy to explore? So what do you replace the PSLE with? Nothing. Lah. We kind of try to backload the thing. Doesn't mean that look, just because you don't have a PSLE, everyone relax, you know, play guitar. No. It doesn't happen that way, huh? Right? You don't have... PSLE was very meaningful 30, 40 years ago when nobody had a university or very few people had a university degree and a PSLE meant that you could get a job in the office. Today, you try to get a job in the office with a PSLE. <laughs> you can't even get a job in the office with a degree. Right? So it's a sacred cow. I know it's a sacred cow. But that ought to be disrupted too. No, just go around the disruption. I don't know if you guys are <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about scrapping PSLE. I will sit down with the Minister of Education at any time of the day to tell him why you should dis, dis, just, just destroy the PSLE. The parents are so stressed. The kids are so stressed for nothing, absolutely nothing. That, that thing has no zero. You know, it's not nothing. It's actually negative. <laughs> you actually think it's nothing, but no, it's actually negative. OK, uh, who else has a question? We got one right over here. Is that it? Uh, Professor Lee. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I hope the government is listening to you, all right? The other thing is that um, we are so s uh, smart ministers around, right? We are still talking to the Ministry of Education. What was the view from him, uh, your suggestion to scrap the PSL? I fully agree with you. But what is his view? What is, does he still want to continue with that? Does he so see I your point? I got a chance to talk to him. Oh, I see. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. If I had a chance to talk to him, I would say that as well. You know, you are right to say that uh, you know the child is being branded. You know, say or either unbranded in a sense because if you don't get a, a degree, especially right now, sorry to say that if somebody if somebody doesn't have a degree from NU, NTU, NUS or SMU, practically it cannot go into the bank. That's what I feel, right? So like you say, change the 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 you know grade the A grades and so forth. How are you going to disrupt them? You know, that is also a concern. I think uh, you write back a very important point as well. Talking about entrepreneurship and so forth, but then all this happens is because of government policies, I believe, that can't create such kind of I mean, a situation right now in Singapore. I think it's time to change. Thank you. Okay, uh, who else? Okay, it looks like what well, we'll about right back there, and then we'll go to the next one. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, my question is to Dr. Rohan. Huh? Just check. Okay, what I want to know is that uh, usually I shop at the Alibaba, the, the website, uh, and the it directly, actually, I, I know that it directly linked to the Ali, Alipay. Uh, Alipay. So I, I, I shop there, then after that, I, I, I log in once, uh, then after that, I, continue, I, ca I can continue to use the platform uh, without actually logging the second second time you see. So uh, for for, pay, for PayPal itself, uh, if let's say I shop in eBay, uh, then uh, I buy something, uh, then after that I must go through a platform, then I need to log in to the PayPal again, then to the, then, then in order to tr uh, complete the trans transaction, you see. So I think that, uh, I think that if let's say that it's a seamless, uh, without without the second, second logging in, uh, it's much more, Better, you see, better to, uh, I mean, uh, not, not, not so much time spent. Uh, every time you need to buy something, you need to log in the second time and all that, then after that too. Yeah, then uh, because Alibaba, that side is direct, is the same company, ma, Ali, Alipay, Alibaba. Then uh, I was thinking that, uh, is it possible? Now, now you need to, Ali, Alipay, you need to give, you need to uh, give your credit card, na, credit card to the Ali, Alipay to, 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 to actually uh, make the payment. Uh. But is it possible that uh, the three things to be linked together, like uh, the, the, the selling, selling and buying platform and the, the payment platform and the bank platform, all three together, then, then that will be totally seamless. You see, not anything, uh, it will be a very smooth transaction go, going over. Is it, is it th that possible can go ahead? Uh, is, is that a possible possibility in that or not? Yeah, I think what you're asking is, um, you know, you have, can you make a payment in the yeah. in the easiest way? Yeah. You know, if you have a Samsung phone or you have an iPhone, can you make a payment by just using your fingerprint anywhere you shop? Right? You don't have to enter your credentials again. And um, Ali, yes, you're right about Alipay and Alibaba. They're one company, still one company right now. eBay and PayPal were one company until two years ago, then we separated. Um, but PayPal has, um, a, has a capability called PayPal OneTouch that as long as you log in once and you tell us that you want to stay logged in, no matter which site you shop at, you don't have to enter your credit card, your uh, username and password again. Um, I have a question for Dr. Rohan. Um, thank you very much for talking about like the money, the party system, and also on the digital currency, right? So, so on your slide that shows the digital currency, so you present PayPal, charge card, WeChat, and also Bitcoin. So my question is, um, we have about money. Does Bitcoin itself can be called as money? You know, in terms of like the Useful definition, middle exchange, store wire, and all those. And uh, I'm not so sure at this time does PayPal accept Bitcoin as a payment? And if you don't, you know, would PayPal would ever consider that? And if you do this, what would you consider the pros and cons to use Bitcoin as a payment uh, medium? 
Yeah, so I mean, I'll share with you my my views of uh, of, of Bitcoin. Uh, so today, PayPal does not accept Bitcoin directly into uh, into the wallet. Um, so Bitcoin for me is just like buying a stock. Um, if you want to buy a stock and you want Bitcoin to be one of the stocks, you can go ahead and buy it. The the challenge with me of having Bitcoin being a currency is the volatility associated with the currency with the Bitcoin. You as a merchant, if you were selling me uh, something and wanted to accept Bitcoin and you sold me a car and I gave you one Bitcoin which was worth I think a couple of uh, you know twenty thousand dollars and then day after tomorrow it's worth nine how would you feel right it, and so the, that's the problem with this it's a good commodity that you could go and trade on but I think the whole points of currencies is the stability that is associated with the currency so the because otherwise it just becomes like the you know Brazilian rei back in 1990s, which had a thousand, you know, year, thousand percent appreciation every month. So you don't want that. You want stability in your currency. What, what Bitcoin does is the three things associated, in my opinion, about in any currency. There's the value of the currency and the stability associated with it. There's the authentication. Is Are you getting the money from who you said you were getting it from, right? And it's not somebody that he stole the money and then gave it to you. And then there's the speed associated with it. Um, and so I think, you know, of course, there's a bunch of things. Speed, as I mentioned, is a commodity right now. I think authentication is something that you can solve for by people giving you policies and saying, if it's not it, I will cover you, what credit cards do, what PayPal does, et cetera. And then there's the value. And so I think that's the way I would look at a Bitcoin. And so for me, it's more of a commodity that you could buy and sell and trade. Um, but I, I personally would not use it as a currency. Okay, are there any questions way back in the back? We don't want to neglect anybody in the back here. Uh, and is that, yeah, we got one over here, and then, then we'll come to you, sir, from us. Um, but we'll make sure if you have a question, don't be shy. Uh, two questions from Dr. Rohan. Huh? Is it safe to submit our credit card 16 digit plus the three authentication number at the back of the card through internet? The second question is, my PayPay account has been disrupted. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your what account has been disrupted? So your PayPal account? Pay, PayPal. I used to use the uh, internet to pay for services. And I find it very convenient. But somehow, I received a letter saying in voice that I make some payment that I never done. You know, and it's from, from other country, US. Uh, Europe and all that. And then they asked me to rectify it, you know. Okay, your account has been limited, you know. You, you need to do this, you need to, or something like that. Yeah. So on the second question, we can, you can send me an email and we can solve that. I don't think I, everybody wants to hear your and my problems. I, my, my, my concern <laughs> is to know whether it's fake or not. No, no, yeah, I know. So I, th I, I'm very worried to reply to that. Yeah, yeah. So I think you're right. So I think you could send me forward me the email and I can tell you whether it's a spoof email or not because the amount of spoof that's happening right now in the world is just incredible, right? So yeah, when somebody tells you you've made a payment and you, actually, and you don't think you have, do not click on the link, okay? If you're concerned, if you have a PayPal account and you are concerned, just forward the entire email to spoof at paypal.com and somebody will reply to you and tell you whether it's, it's a spoof email or not. On your first question, you know, I personally think it's, it's very scary to enter your credit card information and your CVV number on random websites, right? There's a lot of websites out there. And I think that's the re one of the reasons why PayPal is, has been so successful, is that you enter it into one place that keeps it secure, and then you don't have to enter that information into any other website, especially the smaller ones, right? And so I would, you know, and, and in addition, the challenge also is sometimes these websites you can download something bad on your computer, and every single time you type something on your computer, it's known as a man in the middle attack, that, that um, piece of software can read that information and siphon it off to somewhere else. So in general, I'd avoid, I'd, I'd recommend putting your credit card information in one place, um, and then using that service to actually you know, charge your card for you.
you know, we'll, we'll let you, you, we'll let you address him, but please, by all means, raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. I have this question uh, to the panel, who can <laughs> may answer me. Oh. I, I just want to uh, understand whether is there a possibility that governments will issue uh, digital currencies in the future? So I think what government mean well g governments issue currencies, <laughs> right? So um, every every government has the currency and they can digitize it. I think the question is maybe is do you see perhaps one of the perhaps if I'm interpreting your question is. So Singapore has a Singapore dollar, uh, you know, India has Indian rupee. Is there a point in time that we would see no more printing of currencies, but everything just being digital? And I think you are gonna see that. I think the, the, the move is to try to get to that point. You know, Sweden um, basically abolished, or Norway it was, abolished um, check writing. Okay, there are no more checks in the system. Um, Indian government did demonetization two years ago. It was a, the most boldest move in any government in the history of, at least that I've known, where they basically said, okay, from tomorrow morning, every single 50, 50 sing note doesn't, is not valid anymore, right? I mean, it's crazy. So what happens is everybody starts thinking they need to digitize. So I think more and more countries are making a big push towards digitization. And it's to actually take care of a bunch of things, right? One is, of course, the cost, the cost of actually producing that currency or the coin or the dollar or whatever, or the paper note, et cetera. But it's actually really to actually, in, especially in this, in, the, in this day and age, to really be able to track um, you know, terrorist activity and making sure that you're not funding you know, bad people to actually go and do bad things, right? And that, that's more and more of the concern. And of course, there's also tax evasion that's associated with that as well. But it is, you know, in a high in a world that's becoming more and more concerned about security, I think the push for digitization by governments are actually getting, you know, in intensified, and I think that's a good thing. And and uh, just to add on to that, you know, there are going to be unintended consequences from this push to digitization. So, for example, one of the things that is being talked about in the region is digitizing. Uh, the supply chain. So let's say a national government has some commodity uh, that they then mine and then they send it in, uh, they mine it, they put it in a truck, pass it along, they put it into a storage area, they, and then they take that and then they move it down to a boat and then they ship it to another country. And at each step along the way, the employees still a little bit, just a little bit, not enough so it's really noticed. But by the time it gets all the way down, that's a lot of money lost. Like Indonesia loses about $10 billion a year through its national gas reserves, through this pilferage. Now here's, here's the trick. So when, the, when the, that uh, uh, gas or coal or whatever is pilfered, the employees take it, sell it, and distribute the proceeds amongst themselves. So for somebody who's lower down on the, uh, the, the totem pole, you know, they still may, may get an extra 10, 15, 20% per month through this pilferage. Now think about this. The company is aware this is occurring. And so when they set the budgets, yeah, they set it lower. Now all of a sudden, you remove 20 or 30% of somebody's income. That could have really profound social stability. I mean, it could really profoundly affect you know, uh, the society, and it could actually lead to social instability. And so part of it thinking through this process of digitization is what the consequences of art are. It's, it'll happen. It's whether we think through it enough that we can come up with reasonable solutions or at least approaches should those unattended consequences uh, manifest. So is there, well, j I want to make sure we're in the back over here, any, well, <coughs> There's somebody right, oh, yes, right over here. Uh, good evening, all the panel speakers. I'm directing this question to Dr. Rohan. Uh, as you know, in Singapore, we have uh, several organizations that uh, provide uh, digital payment solutions, like, uh, for example, they have uh, DBS PayLa, and also have Samsung Pay, and so on. And uh, the, in fact, the government is trying to unify all these uh, digital payments. Uh, how about uh, PayPal? Do do you have something that which you can come up for a solution to unify the, those uh, 
digital payments in Singapore. Like for example, uh, uh, create something like a QR code that you can use to uh, for digital payments. Yeah, no, I'm actually on some of the the councils that are looking at um, uh, you know pay now, for example, right? And I think the 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 way to look at these things is. Um, I think every one of these solutions are trying to solve different problems, right? I mean, pay now, for example, you know, if we can, if if we can associate everybody's, um, and I think it's a very good, great initiative that we're doing. If we can associate everybody's phone number with their bank account, and then we can actually have a system where everybody, every Singaporean, every person who's here has their phone number linked to their bank account, then the government can start actually starting to disperse funds very easily when they actually were they're doing tax returns or they're doing other things associated directly into the account. So they have a system in place to make that happen. Um, person to person payments, which is what you know, pay now can do. So you can pay your cab driver, perhaps you can pay you know, different kinds of people in, involved, et cetera. Um, but then the question is, where do you get protections from? Right? Are you gonna give, are you gonna send, if you're gonna send money to somebody and you don't know them through this method, who's gonna protect you if something goes wrong, right? And so, in some of these things, in s these these things like you know the PayNows or you know PayPal has a person-to-person -person, uh, payment product, and different companies have that, whether it's a PayLa, etc. Um, these are these are a lot of the movement of money is becoming commodity, which is what we started the discussion with, and it's really the value-added services on top of it that become very important, right, for the for the solution. Um, so you want to have the added protection. So just as an example, right, we, are all, we, we, we just said, okay, what are the value-added services can we offer? When you buy from a, from a travel website, suppose we say if you pay with PayPal, just like some of the credit cards do, for example, you pay with PayPal, and if you decide to cancel a trip, we'll give, you, we'll give you the cancellation insurance. And that's the value of making sure that you're using us as opposed to someone else. The banks aren't going to do that necessarily because it's not in their interest and it, they have different revenue streams, different core competencies, different capabilities. So I think there's a space for pure, pure play payment providers to provide services like this. And then there are other areas where pretty much, you know, it's, I would say it's the commodity of you know, which one you use. Because it gets very confusing for the consumer also, right? Which one should I use? Which one should I sign up for, et cetera? Okay, anybody over here have a question? <coughs> we want to see. Oh, okay, if we could uh, just bring the microphone down, we go. Um, actually, I'm speaking on behalf as a student myself. So, actually, I'd like to target about the education side. So, to Professor Lee about the disruption in our world today, you know, the the world is changing so fast these days. So as a student, is there anything that we should be taking note about, like how to uh, uh, prepare ourselves for the future um, to actually adapt to all these changes? Because right now, probably what I learned today, five years later, I'm not going to use it anymore. Then I have to study again. So is there certain like things that I should be really taking note about? Um, just, just, uh, that's, that's what we're doing at continuing education anyway. What you learn in university, the takeaway essentially, uh, I mean, Prof Lee has already stated, you know, grade should be taken away in a way. What you're learning at university is not so much the, the facts itself, but just that skill of learning how to find fast, how to make an assessment of whether information is correct or not, that you are being equipped with. So that when you graduate, you're able to take on new skills. And what we are providing in continuing education is that as and when you need it, you come to us, we feed you with that information that is relevant at a point in time, and you move on again. So in a way, it's very similar to what not taking courses at university. That's how we are learning also. What do we do? Oh, we said, if I don't know something, what do I do? I Google. You get information out. But nowadays, with all the fake news, fake, fake, whatever, you're not very sure what exactly is bona fide. And so, in a sense, coming back to university, takes out these causes, 
in the sense that it's a stamp of uh, or authentication there. So that's all it is. That's, that's very bite-sized kind of information. Yeah, I would love to add if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to add a few things if you don't mind, because this is something that's very dear to my heart. And you know, I studied astrophysics. Like, what does that have to do with PayPal, right? Nothing, right? So um, I, I, I'd say a few things. And I'll also talk about hiring as well. Um, for me, um, a grade tells me whether you're just hard working to get to some point or not. Doesn't tell me anything about your intelligence whatsoever. Um, I'd say that to me, what what's important when I when I look to hire people is I look for three things. I look for five, but I'll name three of them. Number one and most important is curiosity. Does the person have inherent curiosity to ask questions? And this is exactly what you're talking about with respect to provide a forum where you can ask questions and make sure that you create or try to extract that curiosity from you because. If you're not curious out of coming out of school or, or undergraduate or graduate, you will never be curious, right? Because this is a, a cesspool for having curiosity, right, number one. Number two, do you have inherent drive? You can be curious, I'm very interested in this, but you may not have, do you have a sense of purpose? And where, and because you have so many different classes and all of that over here, it gives you a sense of finding out what you're, that, if you do find a sense of purpose, it might change down the line. It might change, mine did. But you know that you have drive, which is really important. And the third and most important thing is can you execute? Do you have perseverance? Will you actually, it's like brushing your teeth every morning. Like, do you work every single morning to get to where your end goal is? And if I can find those three things, I really don't care, quite frankly, when I hire people, whether you have domain, whether you know a subject matter. Because a lot of people confuse when they hire people domain for intelligence, and they're not the same. And I don't need a person to be intelligent as long as they're really, really hard working. Because as Einstein said, pers you know, 99 pers genius is 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. So the reason I have that order is because curiosity you can't, you're, you're kind of born with or you need to develop yourself. You can't train, right? Intelligence I can substitute for hard work. And domain, I don't really need the domain. So you're always gonna learn throughout your life. I'm learning today, right? I'm learning about getting disrupted, not getting disrupted, etc. So that's never gonna stop, right? But I think what you can learn from college and, and undergraduate and graduate school is these inherent qualities that will keep with you forever. Um, I, I'm just gonna give some motherhood statement. Uh, because, you know, I get students asking me a lot about this. I, and my personal experience is the following, okay? Uh, you're probably not going to be exactly replicating my path. But I will say the following. Um, in addition to what Rohan is, uh, has said, I, I think you, you just naturally do well in something you're passionate about. Right? And it's kind of like a motherhood statement, right? But I tell you how was the trick. And this is the trick that I, I, I did for myself. Execute, huh? execute. Don't just give motherhood statement. You know, find yourself in a quiet moment. Preferably the room has to be relatively dark, right? Because light usually distracts you a little bit. All right, so, you know, make sure the temperature is right. I'm, I'm not joking, huh? This is serious. For young people, old people, we already passe already. <laughs> That's okay. Young people, right? You gotta, you gotta figure out, right? Right? Figure out, figure out uh, what you, what you really are passionate about, right? And in those quiet, in that quiet moment and quiet space, right? You, you gotta ask one very critical question, and I think that almost determines your passion, uh. almost uh, Not all the time, but almost uh. right? And it's a very difficult thing to do when you're twenty years old. Right? But you can still do it when you're 30 years old, not too late. Right? And you ask yourself this one question. If, again quite motherhood, huh? if tomorrow I die, tomorrow I die, okay? what is the one thing that I miss doing the most? Right? Somebody may say, wow, I really miss eating the best chakwe tiao in the world. Right? If, you, if that is your passion, uh, 
you could just go for it because the world is changing into a gig economy, right? What, what Rohan just told me, looks like a gig economy, right? This guy, what, this doctor, remember he shoots the, I shoot, I eat, I don't know what? Huh? I post, I shoot, I, I eat, I shoot, I post, right? Right? He's passionate about it. I mean, his doctor work, he must be so bored, right? Seriously, you ask yourself in the quiet moments, that, that almost, uh, that one uh, almost is your passion. Right? And, and I tell you, if you kind of don't think too much about, okay, you know, I must be a banker and then I must make money, right? Uh, I tell you why I am here today because I, I, I did that before I went to my PhD and I tell myself, ah, yeah, if, if I die to, you know what I miss the most now? Right. I, I actually told myself, I actually miss learning about economics. That was very weird, you know? It's a very weird moment. It wasn't like, well, I miss my parent, I nah, miss all these things. Doing, nah. so I realized that, wow. Then I realized, okay, nah, I'm going to do economics. Right? Then it just ended up like that, nah, I don't know how. <laughs> right, but it's passion, no? Nah. And isn't you excel in what you're passionate in, that's it. Yeah, and, and, and if you, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take one final question. Also, yeah, keep at it too because, you know, try to do something, do it, commit to it. If you don't like it, throw it away and find something else. That's fine. And then repeat until you find something. So, so the, the, the important thing is to keep at it. Okay, we have one final question. What was the person? Okay. Uh, okay, he's already got the mic on. Okay. Hi, Excellent. I have Hi. a question for Dr. Rohan. So you mentioned that there's disruptions in the economy. So how do a company like yours deal with the disruptions and how can you enhance the cybersecurity in your company for all other companies? So, you know, we, as you said, we, um, I think couple of, there were a couple of questions in that. I'll try to be brief. Um, one is disruption is happening all over the place, right? And so what we need to do is, look, I, you know, as a big company, uh, we're relatively big. Um, it's a classic, you know, um, you can be big, but you're not, as, uh, you're not as fast, right? You can't be big and fast at the same time, typically, right? You can't, can't do that. Um, and so what we end up doing is we end up being really good at what we're big at, and we watch other companies to see what other companies are doing to innovate and to try to disrupt us, and we go acquire them, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what you do, right? I mean, it, no, it's true, right? You have capital, you, you have innovation, and what happens is when you acquire something, you acquire talent. You acquire young, strong, driven, purposeful talent, right? That you bring into the organization and you try to make sure that you don't curtail them or dampen their spirit and you let them keep going. And this is why, you know, companies are acquisitive, right? This is exactly the reason why. So that's one way of you're watching out for the talent. The other, and then you're hiring it into it. The other thing is you're actually going and trying to make sure you change your hiring and you bring in the right group of people who can look as to what we should be changing internally in us. The, I have a general rule which I share with my team that if you're sitting here six months and you look back six months and you think that what you're doing today is the same as what you're doing six months ago, you're, you're dead. <laughs> because the whole world around you has changed. And if you're not changing at the same, at faster pace than the world is changing, you're being left behind. I mean, coming back to talent, the one thing I tell my team, everybody looks about promotion and want to do better and grow and this and that. I said, look, you're in a company that is growing at 30% year on year, 30%, which means every three years it's doubling in size. If you as an individual aren't go growing faster than doubling your, your capability, you're not gonna lead this company down the line, right? So you need to make sure that you're changing all the time. And if you're, sing you're feeling comfortable, it's too late. So I think that's the kind of innovation that you need to bring in on everything you do to make sure that you're staying ahead of the competition and, and, and the industry. Well, oh. Oh, I was just I was just going to say uh, let's give a very warm round of applause to our speakers.
give them another round of applause, please. And before they go, I would like to present uh, each of them a small token of appreciation um, um, to each of them. Um, can, can, I'll just go over. Uh.